Can you hear when I speak? Um, no, I could could try that. But I have a colleague who's um, in, in the room and she said that they are in there. They haven't Recording in progress. Can you hear me? Yes. Try to tell you if you can. Okay. It's not great. <laughs> There are lots of folks online already in our room. Uh, we could try this. Um, there's an echo when I speak. So what I could suggest is I move 
So you don't have to listen to the intro. Um, and then I ask the questions to you each. Um, and then I keep it like this and you intervene in this way. It's work it's working fine. Oh sorry. Okay, gosh, my brain is gonna be all right, so we're ready to go. I will start the session now. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. I have muted my Zoom. Yeah. Sorry, I just had a little brain fog there. So I'm back. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming to this open forum uh, hosted by the Freedom Online Coalition and Global Partners Digital. Um, I'm sorry about the technical issues that we, we just had, um, but we'll get started. Well, uh, I don't know if you're talking to us or somebody there. Talking to everyone or trying. Can you, you can, can you, hear me? You can hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I don't know what's yes. going on. Okay, so let's let's keep going. <laughs> All right, um, take two or three in any case. Uh, welcome again um, to those of you in the room um, and online um, to the session on advancing digital inclusion through the Freedom Online Coalition responding to internet fragmentation. My name is Sheetal Kumar and I'm Head of Global Engagement and Advocacy at Global Partners Digital and I'll be moderating the session. GPD uh, provides the support unit for the Freedom Online Coalition um, and I think I can say on behalf of my colleagues in the support unit um, that it has been a pleasure to support Canada and its chairship uh, this year of the FOC and of course all member states of the FOC um, in um, in, in their work to, to promote and defend human rights online. And the, the goal of this session in particular is to raise awareness of the technical, policy, legal, regulatory uh, measures and actions that uh, currently pose a threat to an open internet. And what we intend to do is to build on conversations um, that Global Affairs Canada has already conducted this year, multi-stakeholder roundtables on this very important topic, as well as the work of the Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation of the IGF. Um, and to discuss the intended and unintended causes and effects of internet fragmentation. So we're joined by our panelists um, who are online. Um, and I will introduce them as we go along and as we go um, through through the panel. But I want to encourage you to think about the questions that will come on to after the panelists have come in with their um, interventions. We will have an open discussion. So please start to think about, and if you're online, start to pose your questions in the chat. Um, think about what steps can the FOC take to prevent fragmentation and safeguard the fundamental interoperability of the global internet. What, when governments seek to address challenges of online spaces, there is a risk that some of the responses can result in fragmentation. How can the FOC ensure that responses are proportionate? How can the FOC work with civil society and industry to promote education and digital literacy? And how do we ensure that underrepresented voices are included in addressing uh, this very important topic? So do start thinking about those questions and questions for the panelists. So we'll start with Ali Funk, who is Research Director for Technology and Democracy at Freedom House and is also an FOC Advisory Network member. Ali, I hope this is going to work and uh, we'll be able to hear you well. Uh, we'll start with you. What is the importance of a global internet and what are the impacts on human rights of internet fragmentation um, that we're seeing and that you've been um, researching, uh, for example, at, at uh, Freedom House? Thank you. Thanks, Shita. Am I coming through clearly? Can you clearly hear me? Clearly enough. <laughs> Wonderful. Love to hear tech, tech and the internet's working at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, lovely to to meet everybody. Like she said, my name is Allie. 
Um, I'm at Freedom House. I oversee our technology and democracy work. Um, and we've done a, some recent research on internet fragmentation. And I'll also add that my colleague Keon Vestenson is in the room at the IGF. So if anybody wants to grab um, a coffee or, or a Danish with him, he's there. Please, please reach out to him. Um, so, you know, for those who don't know Freedom House, just a quick introduction. We were founded in 1941 on the core conviction of creating a world in which all people are free. And our most recent Freedom on the Net report, which analyzes 70 countries around the world, found that internet fragmentation is accelerating at a rapid pace. So more governments than ever before carving up the global internet to create more controllable online spaces. And, you know, the global internet, it's really foundational for our everyday lives, to connect with family members and friends, for our local economies, for our careers, um, or just simply going about your, your daily life. And we wouldn't even be able to have this conversation today or the IGF if the global internet didn't exist in the form that it is. So that's how, you know, I, who is based in Brooklyn, can talk to folks over in Otis or wherever you're calling in from. Um, but what Freedom on the Net sort of dove into is how the, the rise of fragmentation, it's really being driven by governments across the democratic spectrum. So um, countries that we rank free, partly free and not free are all sort of behind this alarming trend. But there are really crucial distinctions. And I think that's those distinctions are really important when we're talking about what are the human rights implications here of, of the um, increasing fragmentation of the Internet. So. Um, some governments are really intentionally trying to do this. They want to cultivate a domestic internet in which disinformation dominates, but independent media and critical commentary can be more easily suppressed. Um, but also a driver of fragmentation is, is inadvertent action. So ones where you know different governments are trying to tackle disinformation or protect user data or deter genuine cyber crimes. But really, regardless of the intention, there's still really serious consequences for human rights. And it's the broad array of rights. So it's everything from due process and free expression. So, you know, a lot of traditional civil and political rights to economic and social on cultural rights and, and the impact on local economies. So just diving in a few a few of those um, the rights today, I'll touch on. So on a fragmented internet, you know, folks might not have access to the same messaging platforms that their family members or like-minded communities who live abroad do. It can be more challenging to build global solidarity and seek account accountability if people can't share human rights abuses during protests or time of conflict to audiences around the world. Um, so if you know, we just look at what's happening over the past week in China, or what has happened over the past month or so in Iran, uh, where people have courageously taken to the streets to protest state actions, and they face really egregious censorship or violence in response to protesting. Um, you know, censors in China are really rushing to scrub evidence of these protests and the police response from the internet, which is limiting how information can travel around the world around what's happening. Um, and then, you know, if you also live in a country where the, the government or state actors really manicure that media environment, internet fragmentation means you have limited access to reliable global information that could empower you to make more informed choices about those in power. So if you just look at recent developments in Russia following the government's brazen invasion of Ukraine, people have limited access to Facebook. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to, you know, independent news outlets because the government ramped up its censorship of foreign sources of information, um, which limited their ability to access reliable information about the atrocities that the um, Russian government was perpetrating perpetrating in Ukraine. It also pushed people to state affiliated social media platforms in Russia like VK. Um, and the, you know, VK specifically, it's partly owned by Kremlin allies um, and maybe more likely to, to censor genuine content. And then I just want to close out by touching on um, how fragmentation undermines privacy and safety online. So we've also tracked how there's been a whole rush of increase of data protection laws. Um, some of which can, you know, really have great safeguards for how companies can use data, 
But many of these laws are sort of what we've called data washing. Um, so they're not only undermining privacy, but also fragmenting the internet further. And they're doing this by burying problematic provisions such as um, mandating domestic data storage, or featuring these really blanket exceptions for national security or state actors. Um, so, you know, in Rwanda, for instance, a new data protection law uh, passed this past year requires companies to store data in the country unless it's otherwise authorized by the country's cybersecurity regulator. And how that undermines privacy or safety of people who are in Rwanda um, is because it leaves personal data vulnerable to abuse. And that's particularly concerning in that context because authorities have prosecuted dissidents based on their private messages or embedded agents in telecommunication companies for surveillance purposes. So uh, really uh, that example is showing how limits on cross-border data transfer undermine privacy and also undermine the global internet. So put simply, we're really concerned how the rising fragmentation is also going to result in rising digital repression because a more siloed internet allows for you know, more censorship, more surveillance, and just the silencing of critics more broadly and makes it more challenging for people to hold those in power accountable. Um, so I'll stop there, but looking forward to the conversation and thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ali, um, and thank you for, for giving some examples of this trend. Um, you mentioned both inadvertent and also deliberate uh, policies um, by governments that muffle dissent um, that also um, result essentially in a control on data flows that undermines um, an open internet. You gave some examples of that um, and spoke as well to how that siloing will and can and is increasing um, digital repression. We'll speak to some of those issues in more detail, including around um, data flows um, and, and data governance frameworks. Um, but for now, I want to turn to uh, Jason Pielemeyer, who is the executive director um, of the Global um, network initiative, GNI, and also co-chairs the FOC Task Force on Internet Shutdowns and is also an FOC Advisory Network member. So, Jason, I wanted to ask you, um, picking up on what Ali said, about the recent uh, developments um, uh, that uh, she mentioned, but specifically focusing on shutdowns and how that phenomenon has restricted people's ability to access and share information. If you could speak to that trend in more detail, that would be appreciated. Thanks, Jason. Absolutely. Thank you, Chital, um, and thank you to the IGF uh, and the FOC and everyone uh, who's on this session, both those attending in person uh, and virtually. It's a real pleasure to be with you. I will try and keep my remarks short since I know we got off to a bit of a, a slow start. Um, I, um, uh, so I want to just kind of start my remarks uh, on Ali. Ali, I think, really helpfully laid out a bit of the spectrum of and the types of policies and activities that can result in internet fragmentation. Um, internet shutdowns um, are in many ways sort of the, the most fundamental form of fragmentation. So um, you know, I think it's worth acknowledging that there is still a tremendous uh, number of individuals around the world who are not yet connected to the internet. And of course, um, that is also a form of fragmentation, but there are many reasons why people haven't been able to uh, connect to the internet, and there are many ongoing efforts to address that issue. Um, in some ways, disconnecting people from the internet once they have established a connection, um, regardless of how that connection is established and how people are using the internet, um, is kind of a paradigmatic assertion of government authority, right? The government sort of saying that it has the right uh, and the power to take away people's connection to the internet, which as Ali very really eloquently articulated, has become incredibly important uh, to many people's lives uh, and livelihoods. Um, and so 
um, that assertion of authority, that that sort of power to, to reach in and pull um, the internet out of people's lives after people have begun to to use it and rely on it for all kinds of different purposes um, is, um, is is extremely concerning and um, I think for understandable reasons has generated a lot of um, uh, pushback and a lot of concern. And so uh, it's it's been you know I think um, great to see. Uh, over the years, the, the number of organizations and the efforts that are uh, underway to try and call attention to internet uh, fragmentation and to internet shutdowns more specifically, um, uh, GNI uh, participates in a number of those uh, different efforts, including the Keep It On Coalition. Um, but we were really uh, pleased when um, the Freedom Online Coalition, with leadership from uh, the U.S. State Department, um, uh, initially raised the idea of, of creating a task force on internet shutdowns to bring together civil society actors um, who are involved in the uh, the advocacy against internet shutdowns. Um, technical experts who are involved in the documenting uh, and, and identification of internet uh, disruptions and shutdowns, as well as governments who ultimately are the ones who are empowered um, to undertake or, or to uh, to have sort of diplomatic engagement around internet shutdowns. Um, and so together with the State Department and Access Now, uh, Gianna has been co-leading this task force. Um, the task force model within the Freedom Online Coalition is somewhat new, um, and perhaps to the budget or others may, may speak to that. I think it's been a really useful kind of uh, experiment and innovation um, that the Canadians as chair have helped to, um, to really foster. And we've been able to use the task force to bring in not only those like myself and I who are members of the broader Freedom Online Coalition Advisory Network, but also additionally uh, relevant subject matter experts uh, into this task force. Um, and to uh, to work together to, work, to to coordinate, to share information, uh, and to foster greater collaboration. So um, I'll just briefly talk about some of the things we've been doing. The task force has had um, just about a year uh, now of work under its belt, and um, so we are looking ahead uh, to uh, to next year and, and how we can continue the work. Um, that the task force has begun this year. Obviously, much of this first year was about sort of pulling together uh, the membership of the task force and establishing our priorities. Um, we've had um, you know, monthly calls of the task force, which provide opportunities to do both general information sharing about shutdowns that we're seeing uh, and what's happening around uh, the world with, with regard to shutdown related advocacy, as well as opportunities to dive deep into particular country situations or particular uh, initiatives and advocacy efforts um, to learn more and share information about them. Um, we've created a repository uh, of resources, uh, including the multilateral statements that the Freedom Online Coalition has put together, other relevant um, resolutions, um, reports, advocacy initiatives, um, so that there is kind of a, a single place where both governments and, and other actors can go to inform themselves and get up to speed and find useful information about how to push back on and uh, and understand what's happening around the world with regard to shutdowns. Um, we've also worked very closely with uh, the Canadian chairs, obviously with the US government as the TFIS government co-chair um, and the advisory network uh, to um, support the Freedom Online Coalition's recent statement on the internet shutdowns that are taking place in Iran. Um, that was a very important statement, uh, the first time in uh, just over a decade that the Freedom Online Coalition had issued a country-specific statement. Um, and uh, we were very pleased with the, the statement itself, the strong language that it used to condemn the shutdowns that were taking place in Iran, um, and, and the precedent that it hopefully establishes for the FOC to um, demonstrate that it can speak with a unified voice uh, on behalf of all the member governments um, when very significant um, and, and egregious uh, disruptions like this occur. Um, uh, we know that the sort of diplomatic coordination challenges that go into putting statements like that together can be difficult, um, but we, um, we really appreciate uh, that, that in certain instances like this, they, they are worth the effort and can have a significant impact. 
Um, we've also done um, um, uh, some work to build out the, the network, uh, working around uh, internet shutdowns, um, and um, have been doing ongoing monitoring uh, with respect to, to the situation uh, in different countries around the world. So, I'll stop there uh, because I know there's a lot more um, that other speakers will, will, will add on this topic, but I'm uh, happy to continue talking about TBIS. And um, what it's also about that my colleague, Don Benikir, is there in the room uh, if there are folks who, who want to reach out to her. She's been coordinating much of our work on internet shutdowns through TFIS uh, and is a really uh, a great resource uh, for the work that TFIS has been doing. Thank you, Jason. You called internet shutdowns a fundamental form of fragmentation um, and, and spoke about the many different types of responses, resources, work that is being done, including through the FOC's task force um, to, address, to address that. And I wanted to now turn to Carolina Rossini, who is a lawyer focusing on intellectual property, open standards and data privacy, to talk about a different um, form of fragmentation uh, and perhaps you can explain to us more why why it's considered that Carolina uh, and the question for you is um, there are now a days multiple different governance frameworks uh, for data for da data governance frameworks regulations um, more voluntary frameworks as well how have these uh, contributed to fragmentation in your view um, and if and how they have how do we overcome that um, uh, and and move towards uh, frameworks that support an open uh, interoperable internet? Sure, thank you, Chital. Thank you so much for organizing this panel. And it's always a pleasure and honor to join my colleagues um, uh, that work and support free and online bodies. Um, so as you mentioned, my colleague was trying to Founder and director for research partnership at the Data Sphere. Uh, the Data is has been up and running for around five years and a half, even if we did not incorporate as a non profit. And we were incubated by uh, another organization that I'm sure you're all well familiar with, which is the Internet and Network. And this Relevant because of our uh, reporting and research for this discussion around data governance and fragmentation. The report that we call we need to talk about that. Can I gonna share the link? Well, the mission of the data sphere value of data for all, and we do that through various uh, through various activities. And partnerships and programs. So I, I really um, uh, invite you all to check that out and, and get involved. Regarding your discussion, in uh, uh, we think as a community around the fragmentation, right? And if you guys remember, a few years ago, the OF put out a report uh, framed fragmentation around the Right, or technical fragmentation, governmental fragmentation, and commercial fragmentation. Data fragmentation, um, uh, 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 government fragmentation, right? So, government action uh, around new policies that then, of course, impact both the technical issue and Around data, as you actually mentioned, only led by governments through policies. We see more and more that fragmented led by communities or business actors that develop their own practices, their own standards, their own principles. Uh, in one uh, research we have done in terms of benchmark of the field, we mapped almost three working on the issue. And we are trying to get here a lot of those ideas together. Um, so, almost improbable that we avoid this. Um, we have also been benchmark of principles and norms 
around the area, and we have found over 34 principles um, from different communities and in different uh, Berkeley geographies and interests. We have more and more principles coming from communities like Beijing, uh, or uh, for it with privacy. But it's interesting that a lot of those that create also normative fragmentation um, out of this uh, own privacy. Um, well, the most common imagery um, of government fragmentation has been divided in this order national internet. And this is long, well known, especially when you think about comparing the approach from China. Yes, and the movement in the direction of national fragmented angles, uh, establishing technical barriers and blocking and e commerce, for example. And while a lot of those forms are legitimate and are rights driven rights, that's the privacy rights, they are certainly intended that we are. That go beyond the purpose of those laws. Foster have more and more block and uh, more on uh, global projects that really access that from the pandemic, climate change, and more. Um, there are three of the local measures that have one is the date of local and and the the asking of uh, locally even if other service second related measures that mandate original transfer or processing abroad under and the third relates to measure that mandates local storage or he had been processing or he be transfer abroad. So with the local and more and more it's interesting that um what are the climate impacts of all those localization measures, right? Which can change, but it's always came out of the COP uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, most recently has developed a mapping of those localization measurements, published a report now in and I'm going to be sharing um, and it has different studies uh, that found different numbers of course there is also a lack of agreement around the concept of, of those issues uh, but there is, this is most recent reports on, on, on this, but there are other reports that have mapped over 100 localizations across the world. Those are fragmented by government or fragmented. But the uh, concept of data sub-right, right? And it's a concept that's getting more and it's more and more nowadays. Um, with lots of countries of the G7 and G20 working on our effort, Europe has now a continental idea uh, level data strategy, and we have a publication, coming I mean, publication, that, and one of our fellows also published on that. I'm gonna share it. Uh, but it's interesting. position of that around data site. The flow for most of the uh, uh, based on the others of we mapped the dichotomy uh, in this part in the report uh, yeah. which talks about data as I mentioned and I just can you hear me? But unpacking this notion of data server rights first prior to you hear me? Uh, that's a powerful hold of the course of the concept of sub right it's right as the authority of a state over a particular territory. Foundational uh, paradigm in our international and use 
uh, how governments are positioning themselves. Um, and foresee governments, right? How you see uh, governments have uh, going towards right? other governments for so, and even after it comes and by sweet self determination determination based on from the uh, also appear a lot um, those I mentioned from original and community. So I know my time is coming to an end, and I will, I can comment more on this later. One thing I need that uh, of this fragmenting, uh, we developed the concept of cross border sandboxes for data with our intelligence and lab programs. I really for that uh, government was one of the funders of that report and here. And this report is really on change the narrative, understanding what data is about, what we need, what are the technologies that are coming up that allow for free flow of data that's right like privacy technology. And we explore this I want to mention that uh, uh, she engaged uh, my colleague and co founder Martin, also there at Adjibala, um person with uh, Trace, and he was announcing a little bit of the work we're going to be doing at uh, on the sandboxes upcoming and, and follow us for, for information on. Thank, Thank you, you. Kara. Thank you, Kara. And I'm sorry we're running out of time. As you know, we lost about 20 minutes with the issues we had. Um, Flavia, I'm going to ask you to stick to two minutes if that's possible, and Bernard and as well. Um, and then we can have some time for, for discussion. So, Flavia, you're head of international relations at Meta. Uh, and I wanted to ask you what can Meta um, or, or companies more generally? Um, who would work with these issues, of course, do to counter fragmentation and promote an open. Yeah, thanks, Chappelle. So hi, everyone. I'm Flavia Alvarez. I lead a method relationship with international orgs and internet governance. So I have been participating in IGF for the longest time. I'm very pleased to be here, even if in online, but I'd love to be there in person. So thanks for joining the panel. I'll be very short and concise. But first, I want to set the stage a little bit um, if, as we think about internet openism in general at Meta. Uh, it's important for us to think about one thing that um, a famous science fiction writer wrote back in the 80s. The famous aspect of life right now is that science gathers knowledge before and faster than society gets, gets, gathers wisdom. So this powerful point sums exactly where we are right now. How to bring wisdom to technology development that we humanize reflecting some of the most important wisdom that society is made, and how to bridge the gap and the speed of change between human rights and technology to ensure that technology serves humans and their rights and not vice versa. So with almost 3.5 billion users we have, Meta's products impact human rights at its center. For good and for well, more than any other company in the world. That's a, a responsibility that we take very seriously. In our view, one of the most important tasks we have to promote on the internet is, is based on twofold. One, to make sure human rights is centric as we develop our products and policies. Two, recognize instances where governments can play a role in the family on the internet. And three, promote new stakeholder international cooperation initiatives to defend an open internet. With the virtual human rights centric approach, we uh, have been looking at each of these for a long time, a long time. As you know, we have taken several steps to make sure human rights is centric in our approach. First, we built a specific human rights team. Then we adopted a mission human rights policy. We launched an oversight board. We create a human rights defender fund. We joined the UN Global Compact, part of the Freedom of Life Foundation. We also recently published our first annual human rights report. 
and we've seen uh, issuance transparency reports twice per year, for years. That includes info and government requests for user data that we use internet disruptions we have faced are really important restrictions based on local law. But we also recognize that the battle for the protection of human rights on the local internet is an existing challenge for all of those that care about the world. So we want Mecca to be and should be seen as part of the solution, not as a part of the problem. When we recognize governments can play uh, the, the goal that the role the government can play in the local internet, we also actually highlight when they can play a role in internet segmentation. As my colleague Ali noted, the Russian Ukraine war accelerate trends in the deglobalization and protectionism and nationalism. And playing out on user sphere too, the rise of authoritarian internet model, the citizen segregation from the rest of the global can internet, you hear me? and subject to extensive you surveillance, you can hear me? presents a risk for the open, accessible internet as we know. So we constantly encourage governments to have the human rights obligations and protect and promote the global free flow of information, recognize access to the internet as human rights, and refuse to resort to internet shuts and downs, which can be harmful to human rights, including free of expression and access to information. And we also encourage them to adopt regulations that permit, promote, or permit and promote cross-border data transfer, rather than prohibit or restricting them. But we also know, particularly in my role, that it's a crucial moment for us to come together and stand up for the free and open internet. So we have been we have been very engaged in the work of the federal Mind coalition. I'm sorry to be rude. I have to ask you to wrap up um, in the next few seconds so we can bring in the others. Yes, I'm about to wrap up. Thank, Thank you. The, the most uh, important part. Thank you. Where we talk about how one we have supported the the, the global internet. Um, now, you know, you just got me out of a line of thought a little bit here. But there are international frameworks that have been uh, collaborated through with stakeholder um, collaborations. So we are part of the Copenhagen Pledge in Tech for Democracy. We have also partnered with several of you here in the rooms, uh, in the room on the global uh, coalition for with regard to global internet and interoperable internet. So the IGF Policy Network on Internet Fragmentation is a result of their work. And then on the cross industry front, we have been working with GiveCT and others. But at the UN level, we are very supportive of the efforts uh, that we are trying to do on the global digital cooperation. And they're participating um, in the, trying to promote the work of the tech uh, envoy in preparation for the Summit for Democracy in 2024. All of these efforts to helping and promote an open internet. So back to you, Chappelle. Thanks for the opportunity. And I hope this was clear. Thank you. Thank you. I now want to turn to Bernard Shen, who is Assistant General Counsel in Corporate External and Legal Affairs at Microsoft, and also an FOC Advisory Network there. Bernard, we've heard a lot about um, data governance frameworks and policies. Can you tell us a bit more from your perspective about the importance of trusted cross-border data flows in avoiding internet fragmentation? Thank you, Chital, can you hear me? That's okay. Great. Thank you to the Freedom Online Coalition Canada and the FOC Support Unit for organizing this session and for inviting me. Uh, as Chantal mentioned, I'm Bernard Shen on the Microsoft Human Rights Team. I'll say a few words about trusted cross-border data flows. Uh, we all talked about how indispensable trusted cross-border data flows are. People need it to access information and things such as healthcare, education, work, and government services and they need to need the flow of data to communicate with each other and work with each other. And organizations of all kinds and sizes, public, private, every point of the world, they also need that data to, to operate and do their work, serve, educate, care for, and employ people. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic showed us how critical that, that is. We saw you know, what during the pandemic, a model for sharing data and taking rapid, informed, and collective action. It can, it's a model can be used to solve other pressing challenges, such as climate change, advancing human rights. Without cross-border data flows, we can't have timely informed collective action. Uh, and pandemics and climate change do not stop at borders. 
at the same time, we recognize it's important to keep data safe, protect privacy, um, so that cross-border data flows will be trusted and supported by people. The types of data all we, we all need to solve humanity's problems range from per purely non-personal information, add like photos or weather patterns to address climate change, to highly personal information such as people's medical records. The notion is that different types of data can have different levels of openness according to their sensit sensitivity and with appropriate protections and control in place. So at Microsoft, we try to do our part in supporting trusted cross-border data flows and fostering responsible data sharing. I'll briefly touch on four things very quickly. One, we help empower people and organizations to share and use data more effectively. There is a data divide, a disparity among countries and organiza organizations in the world in terms of their access to data. So we initiated the open data campaign to help facilitate the open sharing of data to bridge that data divide. Second, we develop and use technologies that allow data sharing while protecting privacy. A couple of examples, we research and use homomorphic encryption. What that means is that it, it allows computing to be made directly on encrypted data without requiring any decryption process. There's also confidential computing, which enables the isolation of a sensitive data set while it's being processed. And we always at Microsoft work hard at cybersecurity. Give you one example, every day, we analyze more than 24 trillion, trillion with a T, security signals around the world to protect our customers from attacks. Third, we advocate for laws, policies, and our international agreements that foster responsible data sharing, keep data safe, and respect sovereignty. That's why we advocate for strong, interoperable national privacy laws that give individuals control over their personal information and fosters people trust in sharing data. Lastly, we stand up for our customers' rights and ask by governments to disclose person, uh, customer data. We do not provide any government with direct unfettered access to customer data. If government asks us for customer data, it must follow applicable legal process. We only comply with demands when we are really compelled to do so, and we attempt to redirect the orders to customers or to inform them. And we routinely deny or challenge orders when we believe they are not legal. In one case, for example, we took the case all the way to the US Supreme Court. So to sum up, we believe that trusted cross-border data flow is indispensable to society, and humanity needs it to advance human dignity, agency, well-being, and advance human rights. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for keeping it short as well. Um, I want to see if anyone has any questions, um, just to make sure that, uh, we come to you. After Philippe, Andre Rodriguez, last but not least, um, will speak. Um, you are Deputy Director of the Centre for International Digital Policy at Global Affairs Canada. Um, and Philippe, I wanted to ask you, Canada has recently held regional consultations on the greatest threats related to digital inclusion. What did you discover through these consultations about the threat of internet fragmentation? Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to keep this very, very brief. Um, I think one of our, of our objectives as chair of the FOC is really to think through the, the, the proper mechanisms uh, to actually drive a more inclusive digital policy agenda at the international level and to really think through what multi-stakeholder governance means in action, in practice. Uh, and so, as you mentioned, we did uh, this, these rounds of, of uh, consultations, uh, in particular in the context of the creation of what we call the Ottawa Agenda, which is not meant to be another declaration. Uh, so I hope you are happy with that, Carolina, but it's really more about what could governments prioritize in terms of their digital policy agenda, especially when it comes to the protection of human rights, democracy, and inclusion. And so we've, we've done a series of roundtables, uh, both with experts, including uh, with uh, the policy network, the IGF policy network on internet fragmentation, as well as a series of regional consultations uh, with civil society organizations and a number of other stakeholders, industry, chambers of commerce, uh, not only in, in English, but also in local languages. So we did uh, one in North America, Latin America, Middle East, Northeast, uh, North, North, uh, and North Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe, Indo-Pacific. 
uh, and I think I'm missing one, but the point is we really went to all the different uh, regions to really think through uh, what does digital inclusion mean to them and what are those threats uh, regionally, locally. Uh, two big, uh, uh, let's say, trends. One, there's much more that actually unites us than divides us in terms of, of threats. So a lot of the same challenges that have been discussed uh, by uh, our, my esteemed uh, fellow panelists today have been raised uh, at, uh, the, the, let's say, the working level. People are concerned about it more so than we could anticipate, uh, or at least that we were anticipating in terms of uh, issues of disinformation, internet shutdowns, uh, surveillance, uh, and, and other uh, uh, other issues uh, that were discussed today. So all of this have been uh, raised. The other big uh, trend here is uh, a wish for governments to be a lot more outspoken and inclusive when dealing with those issues. So really, how it's one thing to say multi-stakeholder uh, governance is important, it's another to actually put it in practice. And so there was a lot of invitation to us to think about how to actually implement those, those governance models beyond, say, technical bodies where there's more of a longstanding practice for multi-stakeholder uh, engagement. And so that's one issue that we took away from those uh, consultations, one that is obviously top of mind uh, here at IGF, and one that we hope to, to put front and center uh, in the Ottawa agenda, in the work of the FOC, uh, and going into all of the different uh, important processes that the UN that we'll have to uh, engage with and that we're excited to engage with, including the Global Digital Compact uh, starting next year. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. Um, that was really interesting to hear about, about those consultations. And so I wanted to give it an opportunity to anyone to come in and react. quickly. We have um, a couple minutes left. Yes. Uh, at the back. Hi, my name is Amdu. I I have a question. I wonder how Thank you for that question. I saw another one here. We'll take both and then we'll go back to the panelists. Thank you very much. My name is Kastan Gavril, part of the UN. Um, most of the conversation around digital fragmentation has been argued that content moderation or censorship is not part of the fragmentation agenda, more of how the DNS is attacked. And uh, my question is there's a rising sense of how alternative DNS, for example, the China IP or use of decentralized internet has a more better angle in including more people. Could that constitute uh, fragmentation and how do we create a more inclusive operation where decentralization actually can help activity rather than it being pro fragmentation? Thank you for that question. A lot of discussions around that, um, what constitutes fragmentation this week. I would encourage everyone to go to those discussions as we don't have enough time to tackle that broad question here, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to ask uh, whether any of the panelists want to respond very quickly to that question about private role of private sector. Um, there's one more question here. Um, and if you can put your answers in the chat, I'm happy to um, make sure that they, uh, they're read out. Or uh, So please um, respond in there as well. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 Public, which is the argument that content select a segment of participants is not a round. Um, most all of the discussions that historically have have focused on technical. I'm wondering, from the panelists, intent failure to come up with a framework of what it is that I frankly hasn't or like community um, by allowing stupid debate to out. Essentially, if we'd built the frame, wouldn't be able to. Yeah, 
not a polite way of question. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, if anyone in the panel who is still with us wants to answer any of those questions about the role of different stake of uh, the private sector, for example, or why are we having, or is content moderation part of the fragmentation discussion, please do raise your hand. Otherwise, please feel free to respond in the chat. I can see Carolina put um, a question uh, or a resource rather in the chat. Um, I see, Philippe, you've got your hand up, and then uh, we will wrap up. Thank you so much. Very quickly, uh, from my end, I think um, when we're thinking about fragmentation, and again, really welcoming the work of the IGF uh, policy network, we have to think about all layers of the, the internet, from really the technical to the information layer. Uh, it's one thing in particular uh, in Canada that we're concerned about is really the integrity of information online. Uh, and thinking through the links, as Ali mentioned earlier, between um, information integrity and internet fragmentation, I think is, is absolutely important and key uh, because fragmenting at the technical, but also at, the, at, at the, the content information layer are things that we should be worrying about. We should be uh, pushing for more conversations at that level and thinking through internet uh, information online uh, as, as, as a fragmentation and as an inclusion issue as well. Thanks. Thank you, Philippe. And thank you all for coming. Um, I, I know that we started very late and not everyone had the chance to speak as they would have wanted. I apologize for that. Um, I just want to say that uh, as we've just heard from different um, uh, people here in the room and online, um, the concept and understanding of fragmentation is varied. But we are starting to have these discussions, including at the IGF, which is an open and multi-stakeholder space, um, in a way um, that perhaps we hadn't seen before. So I really encourage everyone to um, take this conversation to the rest of the IGF, to the intersessional work streams as well, Philippe, you just mentioned the policy network, um, and to engage with the FOC um, on this topic, as we've heard already so many of the um, activities, um, initiatives that the FOC is involved in to protect an open, um, interoperable internet, including tasks of works of task forces, statements, and general coordination and form shaping to defend um, human rights online and an open internet. So we heard there was a desire for governments to do more. So I, I simply encourage everyone to engage um, uh, in, on the topic um, and do more to, to be more vocal, I mean, about, about defending an open um, And we heard about the opportunities to do that, including um, the Global Digital Compact, which is very much on the agenda across the IGF this year, and I'm sure will be next year as well. So thank you so much for coming, um, and I wish you a good evening and good rest of the IGF. And I want to thank the, um, the organizers, in particular Global Affairs Canada, for, for your time. Um, and to all the panelists for theirs as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.